Thank you for joining me in this brief video, which will serve as um, a summary to the study that we just completed called Nothing New Under the Sun. Um, I thought it necessary to have this brief summary to touch on some of the main points of what was covered in a more comprehensive way in a series made up of four parts. Those four parts are Part 1, Looking Backward to Go Forward, and Part 2, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Part 3. The Usual Suspects. And Part 4. History Repeats Itself. Now, there was so much covered in those four parts that I just wanted to highlight some of the main points in this summary because there were some really important points covered that can be applied to our understanding of what is going on in the world today, as well as what we should be looking forward to. Because scripture actually tells us that history bears witness to the future. Now, it's really important to understand that when we study scripture, it is not meant to be an academic endeavor for the sake of facts and figures. But instead, when we study scripture, there are spiritual truth principles being reinforced within us so that we may live our lives according to these principles. And this reinforcement is done on a spiritual level uh, that may even surpass our, our conscious uh, consciousness of it being done within us. And there are prophetic patterns of truth that as well are being revealed to us when we study scripture. Uh, these patterns of truth that are being revealed to us help us to understand not only that which was and that which is now, but also that which is to come. And we can't simply read the Bible. We must study the Bible, even though that's always been the case. For as long as there's been a written record of the word of Yah, it's been necessary, absolutely necessary, to study the Bible and not just read it. But there's even an added reason for taking the approach of study and not just reading Scripture if we're reading Scripture in English or any other language translation besides the original language of Hebrew and Greek but most especially Hebrew. Because really, it's only when we seek to truly understand that which is written in the Most High's Word, and that's from the original culture and intent of what's being said, and not just by virtue of translation, it's only when we really seek to truly understand what's written in the the Most High's word, that we will then be able to have an ear to hear that which he is speaking to us. Because the, the word of Yah is living, and he does speak to us. And as we obey that which he is speaking to us, he then gives to us to grow an understanding of his master plan. And we're able to perceive that which the Almighty has already done and that which he is doing right now and that which is yet being, bring, being brought to pass. And as he does all 
things in his own sovereign timing, we are able to get a glimpse and perceive and understand his doings. All of which is to the fulfillment of the sovereign plan of the Almighty Creator, who is creator and maker of the heavens and the earth and all the hosts thereof. Now, if we don't have a very clear view for what the Most High is indeed doing, we can be drawn away by the agenda of anti-Messiah. We must always remind ourselves that anti, as in anti-Messiah or anti-Christ, not only means opposed to, in which case anti-Messiah would mean opposed to Messiah, but it also means in place of, so as to say, in place of Messiah. And the counterfeit is what can be most dangerous to the body of Messiah because in place of can be quite alluring and quite deceptive because this counterfeit agenda appeals to the natural man's sense of what is right. While at the same time being draped with the words of scripture to make it sound legitimate and wholesome and, and righteous. But we must remember that the best counterfeits are the ones closest to the real thing. Which brings us to our key verse of, of study being Ecclesiastes 1.9. So let's read it again together. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. End of quote. I mean, can we see just how powerful that statement is? The Most High is telling us that to the extent that we understand the patterns of truth that are being presented to us and revealed to us in his word is the extent to which that which is, that which was, and that which will be is being revealed to us regarding his plan and his purposes for his creation. So that means that we will not only perceive and discern the plots and schemes of the enemy of our souls, but even more importantly, we will be able to discern between that which are the acts of the Most High and that which is the great deception that has been prophesied to come and has always been in the making. Which is why our Messiah gave to us this stern warning in Matthew 24, verse 24. For false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. End of quote. We are living at a time when much is being uncovered as to what Satan and his minions have been up to through the world system. But we can't allow that information to become our compass for understanding the unfolding and establishment of the sovereign plan of salvation, which is indeed being implemented with the establishment of our Messiah's kingdom, which is first established in the hearts of mankind and then becomes apparent with the second coming of Messiah, 
and his millennial reign on earth. Now, with that in mind, how may we safeguard our hearts from deception? Well, the only way that we may guard our hearts is with the word of the Most High. The Bereans are a great example for us in that they search the scriptures daily to see if what Paul and Silas were saying was true. And for that, they were praised and they were called noble-minded because our, our focus must be on the word of Yah. It is he who protects us from dangers seen and unseen. The word of Yah is so rich that we can never feel like we know all that we can know of his word. Neither should we feel that there is a limit to that which we can know. And the rest is for the pastors, the preachers, the evangelists, the prophets, etc. Because we have all been called to be, to be ministers of his word and to be ministered to by his word as he heals and he restores us in the realm of the spirit, the soul, and the body. And that's all to the esteem and honor of his name which is his character being molded in us with every act of obedience. Now, it's very easy to be drawn away into that which is deception because even after being born again, there yet remains the flesh, which can be tempted. Even in the natural, it's easy for a shiny object to catch our attention. But the Bereans were like master jewelers. Master jewelers train their eyes to discern that which is genuine from that which is false by putting their focus on that which is genuine. They study that which is genuine so much so that when that which is false comes into their view, they can spot it. And that is tremendously important, especially in the days that we're sovereignly been chosen to live in. Which is a time that has been shaped by the information age. What has been called the information age? actually started somewhere around the 1950s with the development of computer technology impacting the way that we're able to gain access to information. Truly, how wonderful it is to have access to so many translations of scripture as well as study aids such as the Interlineal Bible or the concordances and lexicons. I mean, how truly wonderful it is to have access to a virtual library, the tips of our fingers with, without ever leaving the house. However, as we consider any materials which may disclose the hidden workings of the world system, May we do so with wisdom, knowing that facts do not dictate truth. No, facts are always subject to the truth. And so that means that even in as much as how we understand facts and what conclusions we draw from facts, they're always subject to that which is truth. And facts are subject to change while the truth remains the same. And even truth can be deceiving if we're not able to or willing to receive the truth. 
because the truth is the word of Yah. And the truth that one rejects is the truth that one is deceived by. That's from James 1, 22. And so we want to be careful to stay focused in truth and consider all things through the lenses of scripture that we be not deceived in this era of information, this time of information and great deception. Because deception can come from denying truth for the sake of facts, which simply reinforces the approach being that of the Bereans who were like master jewelers as they searched the scriptures to see if that which they were hearing was truth. And also, if the conclusions that we draw from that, which may be factual, but not scriptural. Also, during the course of our study, we talked about the word image that was used in the book of Genesis 1, verse 26, where the Most High revealed the days of creation. And he tells us that he made mankind in his image and likeness. Now, we see the words image and likeness in several places throughout Scripture in both the Old and New Testament. For example, in the New Testament, we're told that those who Elohim foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We see that in Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. And in Romans 8, verse 3, we're told that our father sent his sinless son in the likeness of sinful flesh. End of quote. Okay, so the primary difference between the two words is that the word likeness speaks more generally of two things that may, that's two or more things that may look similar, but without there being any specific relationship between them. Uh, for example, a row of trees that may look similar and may even be of the same species, but without a specific relationship between either of them, except for the fact that they're all trees. And on the other hand, the word image describes the relationship between the reflection of a specific person or thing and the person or thing it specifically reflects. For example, the image in the water is a reflection of that specific tree, and not all trees. And it's this word image that is used in several places such as Genesis 1, verse 26, and the Greek equivalent is given to us in Romans 8, 28 to 30. As well as in the book of Daniel, we see the Aramaic equivalent to that Hebrew word being used to describe the prophetic image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. And so, in our study, we discussed how the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is more than a physical statue. It is an image representing the spiritual idolatry 
that was formed from the captivities that Yarashalem or Jerusalem suffered as represented in the succession of captivities by the nations that are illustrated by the different metals in the image. In the segment of our study entitled The Usual Suspects, we discussed as well the fact that the world is currently yet under the revived Roman Empire and exactly what that means as far as identifying um, the spiritual entities that operated at the time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah and how they are yet in operation today and what that means to the body of Messiah or body of Christ. Truly, there is much that can be learned in our study of scripture when we start to see the patterns, types, and shadows that the Most High has provided us in his word. Ancient Biblical Hebrew is, of course, older than Greek. And there is archaeological evidence that the ancient Hebrew called Avarit is a picture language, which is beautifully rich in conveying meaning in a very concrete manner. It just goes to show that not all change is for the better. In fact, the farther away that mankind has progressed, so-called progressed, from paradise, the paradise <laughs> of the Garden of Eden, we see the evidence of the fall from Yah's favor. We have to really pause and think on that. All the things that we think are such conveniences, there was really no need for them in paradise. Now, in our study, we discovered that the author and finisher of our faith, who is identified um, in, as the Alpha and Omega in the book of Revelations, is the Aleph Tav in the book of Genesis. So yes, we, we covered quite a bit in the study. May each of us in our own continued study of scripture take what has been discussed in the study and continue to uncover more that will add to our understanding of that which is, that which was, and that which is yet coming in the fulfillment of Yah's master plan of salvation for his creation. May we be motivated, not by seeking information for the sake of information, but rather that we guard our hearts against deception by building our understanding of his word and our obedience to his word. Hen, Ushalom Mishpaka, favor and peace, family.